Some call it a masterpiece. Others call it a bastardization of a classic novel. It's referenced in countless other movies and TV shows and given many viewers nightmares. Its meaning is often debated and picked apart in film circles. And the context in which it came to be is one rife with controversy. I'm talking about Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of Stephen King's hit novel, The Shining. It's a film that has been a staple in popular culture since it came out in 1980. Yet, its legacy is not without plenty of scandals. The creation of The Shining is one riddled with chaos, misfortune, conflicting life philosophies, and dueling egos. We're exploring all of that and more in this episode of Production Tales from Hell. Hey everyone, it's your twisted woman here, Chauncey K. Robinson, and welcome to Production Tales from Hell, where we dive into all the fire and brimstone it took to make the horror films we know and love, and in some cases, the darkness that followed their release. In this episode, we've got a play date with some hotel dwelling ghosts, or delusions, depending on who you ask, as we explore the rich and dark history behind The Shining. There are five circles of film hell, development, production, post-production, distribution, and perhaps the most dreaded, Limbo. The Shining met with the devil many times before it was released. Egos and warring philosophies crashed against one another in development hell, while accidents and perfectionist tendencies created a torturous atmosphere during production. Ultimately, the ramifications of a hellish set and the resultant polarizing film led to a legacy that is still hotly debated in the dark film corners of the internet. Before diving into that dark legacy, though, I want to thank our partner, WeTransfer. WeTransfer believes creativity is the driving force behind humanity. So it's their mission to make sure your creativity is free of its own production hell. Picture this, you're a YouTuber enjoying a rare vacation. It took a lot of work to set that time aside, but you did it. You even got ahead on video, so two will come out while you're gone until you find out that one of the uploads is stuck with a bogus copyright claim. You'll need to re-edit the whole thing, but all the files are on your home computer. Don't worry, WeTransfer can solve this. After all, they specialize in sharing and sending big files. You just need to have a friend pop by your house and they can send you every file you need. They can even add password protection for that extra bit of security. Plus, you can do more than access your own files. After all, WeTransfer is for individuals and for teams. And we trust WeTransfer so much, we're using it to deliver exclusive bonus content to you. Go to the link in our description to access a commentary track with me, James, and Chelsea for each of the movies we've covered on Production Tales, as well as a zine featuring exclusive art. The Shining is a 1980s psychological horror film directed by Stanley Kubrick from a screenplay he co-wrote with novelist Diane Johnson, not Stephen King. More on that later. It stars Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, Scatman Crothers, and Danny Lloyd. The film tells the story of writer and recovering alcoholic Jack Torrance and his small family. Jack accepts a position as an off-season caretaker for the historic and totally haunted Overlook Hotel. He is accompanied by his wife, Wendy, and their young son, Danny. Danny has the gift of the shining, a psychic ability that allows him to see the spirits trapped in the blood-soaked past of the Overlook Hotel. Things get treacherous when a snowstorm sets in and the hotel influences cause Jack to lose his mind. Danny and his family are in real danger and may not make it through the winter if The Overlook has anything to say about it. The Shining was originally a novel by legendary horror author Stephen King. Nearly three decades into his career, famed director Stanley Kubrick chose the book as his next movie source material. Right away, things started off on a testy note as Kubrick and King began butting heads when it came to their visions for the film. The demons of dueling egos and conflicting visions have arrived. After the lackluster response to his 1975 film, Barry Lyndon, Kubrick looked for another book to adapt to screen. 
this time a horror book. Maybe he was regretting how a few years earlier he had turned down the chance to direct The Exorcist. Before Kubrick settled on The Shining, he considered adapting novelist Diane Johnson's book, The Shadow Knows. Johnson would eventually end up being Kubrick's co-writer for The Shining, not Stephen King, even though he originally wrote a screenplay for the film himself. But Kubrick rejected King's script, saying it was too literal of an adaptation. And this wasn't just a case of a director wanting to take a different approach to a book he liked. Neither Kubrick nor Johnson thought The Shining, as a novel, was all that good to begin with. In an interview with Michelle Simont, the director had this to say about King's successful book. Well, the novel is by no means a serious literary work, but the plot is for the most part extremely well worked out. And for a film, that is often all that really matters. Johnson would take this sentiment even further, as she was quoted in the Parisian magazine Positive saying, Among us, the Shining novel is not part of great literature. It is scary, it is effective, and it works, without further ado. But it is precisely interesting to see how a very bad book can also be very effective. It's quite pretentious. Someone sounds a little jealous that the studio decided to not go with her book. I'm just saying. The casting of the film only deepened the divide between visions for the project. When it came to the pivotal role of Jack Torrance, Kubrick had Jack Nicholson in mind as his first choice. His secondary picks included Robert De Niro, Robin Williams, and Harrison Ford. Stephen King hated all of them as options, especially Jack Nicholson. King felt Nicholson wasn't right for Jack due to his previous performance in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. King saw Jack Torrance as an ordinary man driven to madness. He thought Nicholson would spoil that journey, since the audience would already see him as crazy and unstable. King's protests were ignored, since Kubrick made sure that he could contractually make any changes he wanted to King's work, and that the actor for the lead role was not negotiable. Yeah, things were not getting off to a harmonious start at all. Having read the novel, Nicholson suggested Jessica Lange for the role of Jack's wife, Wendy. In the book, Wendy is more of an independent character with obvious inner strength, but Kubrick had a different idea for the Wendy he wanted in his adaptation. The director wanted Wendy to be more submissive in her relationship with Jack. He envisioned a Wendy who was emotionally beaten down and constantly in a state of fear, perhaps even a victim of domestic abuse by Jack. This drastic change in characterization would be another point of contention for King. Kubrick cast Shelley Duvall as Wendy, a role that would affect her life for years to come. Aside from casting disputes, there were also creative differences about Ghost and the Afterlife significant parts of The Shining story. One could argue that the Overlook Hotel is haunted, at least in King's adaptation, where it most certainly is. This was another place where King and Kubrick butted heads, as the director leaned more towards the psychological when it came to the story's danger. Years later, King would recall a phone call he had with Kubrick when the director was first working his way through the book. The author recalled Kubrick saying, Well, don't you find that all ghost stories are optimistic? Don't you think so? Because it means that the presupposition is that if there are ghosts, there's an afterlife. We don't just die, we, we go on. King's reply to the director was, Mr. Kubrick, what about hell? King noted that after a long pause on the other end of the line, Kubrick replied in a very stiff voice. Oh, I don't believe in hell. Sounds like a pretty big conflict of philosophies when dealing with a story about evil ghosts in a hotel that might symbolize hell. Fires, cruelty, and endless takes, oh my. The production of The Shining would prove to be a hellish endeavor for many involved. Many of the sets used in The Shining were constructed at EMI L Street Studios in England. This was where several other high-profile movies were made, such as Star Wars and Indiana Jones. The Overlook Hotel set included a life-size model of the hotel's exterior, modeled after the real-life Timberline Lodge on Mount Hood in Oregon, which was used for some of the film's establishing shots. Unlike most directors who normally jump around the script while filming in order to save time, Kubrick was intent on filming the entire movie in chronological order. He did this, partly, so he could continue making changes to the script as they filmed. This meant The Shining occupied the studio's sound stages for 56 weeks, with all the sets continuously kept lit and ready for filming. Tragedy struck in January 1979 when a fire broke out after filming had stopped for the day. 
Doug Milsom, the movie's camera assistant, recalled in an interview that the roof of the studio set was burnt through and that they lost several cameras. Kubrick's widow, Christiane Kubrick, would later state in an interview that the director thought the significant delay due to the fires was, quote, quite fun because he could rethink certain things. Ray Marin, the film's sound editor, recalled that Kubrick's only concern during the fire was making sure nothing happened to the sound that they had recorded. There's actually an infamous picture of Kubrick laughing as he stands around the wreckage left by the fire. Perhaps a little macabre, but the fire did result in at least one funny incident. Actor Norman Gay, who played the ghost with the glass of scotch and an axe gash in his head, had to hide from the paramedics during the fire since they thought his wound was real and wanted to take him to the hospital. As if a raging inferno wasn't enough to deal with on set, the actors also were subjected to emotional turmoil. All of it was in the name of getting the perfect shot, but at what cost? Kubrick was a perfectionist when it came to getting a film take exactly how he wanted, and nowhere was that more evident than in The Shining. Reportedly, Kubrick shot 60 takes of the wordless scene where the movie's true hero, Dick Halloran, sits on a bed watching TV. Dick was played by Scatman Crothers, who was 68 when he shot the film. In a 1980 Fangoria interview, Crothers said that the scene where Jack hits him with an ax took 25 takes, requiring him to fall on the floor 25 times. The film also set a Guinness World Record for most retakes for one scene with dialogue. The scene in question involved Crothers and Danny Lloyd, who played Danny Torrance in the film. Their scene discussing the psychic ability of Shining took 148 takes. Coming in at a close second, but still a ridiculous number of retakes, was a scene in which Shelley Duvall had to swing a bat at Jack Nicholson. That scene reportedly took 127 takes. Duvall's time on the set of The Shining is perhaps the most infamous and ghastly. In the on-set documentary, Making the Shining, filmed by Kubrick's daughter, Vivian, viewers are able to witness what Duvall went through while filming. In one behind-the-scenes moment, Duvall mentions she has lost some hair due to the on-set stress. As she mentions her troubles, Kubrick can be heard telling the crew, well, I don't sympathize with Shelley. In another moment, after some miscommunication on set, Kubrick tells Duvall that she is wasting everyone's time. You're just wasting everybody's time. In an interview with the legendary film critic Roger Ebert, conducted months after the premiere of the film, Duvall opened up about her experience. During the day, I would have been absolutely miserable. After all that work, the reviews were all about Kubrick, like I wasn't even there. Later, in the commentary for The Making of The Shining, Vivian Kubrick confirmed that her father deliberately bullied Duvall in order to enhance the insecurity and helplessness in her portrayal of Wendy. Stephen King complained about this adaptation of Wendy, calling the film misogynistic and saying that Wendy Torrance is just presented as this sort of screaming dish rag. This stressful time on set for more than a year would haunt the actress's career for years to come. Although The Shining has pretty high marks from modern critics, it wasn't a beloved hit when it first came to theaters. A reviewer in Variety stated that Kubrick has teamed with jumpy Jack Nicholson to destroy all that was so terrifying about Stephen King's bestseller. Gene Siskel called it a crashing disappointment. Perhaps the biggest critic of the film was Stephen King himself. It makes sense for him to be protective of the story since The Shining is one of King's most personal works, inspired partly by his own struggles with alcoholism. Of Kubrick's film, King gets quoted as saying, Kubrick just couldn't grasp the sheer inhuman evil of the Overlook Hotel. So he looked instead for evil in the characters and made the film into a domestic tragedy with only vaguely supernatural overtones. That was the basic flaw. Because he couldn't believe, he couldn't make the film believable to others. King would go on to write a TV miniseries of The Shining, directed by Mick Garris and broadcast on ABC in 1997. His screenplay was a much more faithful adaptation of his novel. Kubrick's film would also be nominated for two Razzie Awards, Stanley Kubrick for Worst Director and Shelley Duvall for Worst Lead Actress. In early 2022, the Razzies would retract Duvall's nomination, citing the abuse she was subjected to during production. Oh boy, that was a lot of hell to go through. The question now is, does The Shining come through unscathed despite all that chaos? Get your pitchforks ready, because I'm going to say that it does not. 
In looking at The Shining from a visual perspective, it is a haunting film with beautifully stylized moments. But Kubrick and Johnson didn't respect the source material to begin with. So a Stephen King story, this is not. And in knowing the unfathomable pressure Duvall was put through, it pretty much taints any joy one can get from her harrowing performance. No amount of artistry justifies a dangerous and cruel workplace. Still, it's hard to dismiss the cultural impact the film has made on cinema today, for better or worse. And will someone please give Shelley Duvall her flowers? Because despite the hate she received, both on set and in public, she is perhaps the most compelling part of this movie. She went to film hell and back and survived. The road to this movie hell was paved with high stress and probably took over 200 takes to get there. I'm Chauncey K. Robinson, and this has been Production Tales from Hell. Stay creepy out there.